Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in. I'm Matt Powers, author, educator, seed saver, soil citizen scientist, and family guy, and I teach people all over the world how to live more regeneratively. And today I wanna to talk to you about oxygen. And where is the oxygen going? Because scientists are you know, baffled right now. They're, they're, they're confused and they're wondering where this, this additional oxygen has gone because they're seeing the thinning atmosphere, they're seeing the leak out of the atmosphere, but they're also seeing you know, the CO2 being formed and, and taking up the oxygen there. But if we put them all together and then we start looking at the greater picture, we still see that gap. And I think it actually has to do with the fact that that gap began over 10,000 years ago. And the timing of that looks like a lot like it's the same timing that agriculture began. And that means that that would be the oxidation of the soils. That would mean that that would be the tilling of the soils. So tillage is the combination of air and soil. We're breaking up the soil, but we're aerating it and we're, 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 we're making it fluffier, you know, whether it's your rototill or it, 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 on a farm, you know what I mean? They're, they're adding air into the soil and that to a degree can be great. You can raise paramagnetism with oxygen, but you oxidize the soil and that's a huge loss of CO2 into the atmosphere, the carbon in the soil. And the problem with that really is, is that when we oxidize soils, we lock up their nutrients. And so the soils of the earth are, for the most part, desertified. And it's you know grazing, it's through agriculture in a large part, and there, 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 there's, there's climate change as well. But it, it is the case that we can, we can turn this around. But look at it for a second. If most of the world's soils are oxidized, then that means that they've combined with oxygen. Regardless of how it happened, that means the oxygen is locked up in our soil. And it's like the carbon's in the sky, the oxygen's in the soil, everything's backwards. We're losing the energy from our soils because carbon, let's first, let's first take apart uh, oxidation before we get into carbon. But like oxidation is the loss of energy. That's why they call it redox, reduction and oxidation. Reduction is the gaining of electrons and oxidation is the loss. And the way we can remember this is you light a match or you light some wood on fire and it releases smoke. And you're like, oh, there's CO2 being lost. There's carbon being lost. It's like, well, oxygen is liberating it. And it just needed that spark to do it. And so all this tillage is burning up the soil carbon. And that loss of that carbon is paired with the loss of the energy and the potential to hold energy. And the reason this is important is, is the same reason why you have trees where they're putting radioactive isotopes at their roots and having that nitrogen go up into the top of the tree. And they're like, how did it go that fast? It doesn't make any sense. And then everyone had to rethink all their theories around how things work. And, and one, of those, one of those things to come out of that as a solution to that is fourth phase water. And that is amplified by energy, by solar radiation. It is the case that the loss of energy in the soil equates to immobility of nutrients. Because as that carbon goes, as the, everything becomes oxidized, loses that energy and those nutrients are now locked up. So it's, 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 it's a holistic exchange of conditions from one where nutrients can flow and energy can flow and the soil can hold water and holds a charge to one that is completely desertified and losing energy and things are oxidized and locked up and, and, and still and not circulating. And that's really the issue because plants are the solar panels. They take in the solar radiation. At the same time, the plants are liberating oxygen. And of course, you know, cyanobacteria and algae and all of them, you know, kelp and all seaweeds are also doing this as well. Ocean plants do it at an order of magnitude higher, so 10 times higher than land plants do it. This photosynthetic energy is like the way that the carbon cycles actually run. So, 
I know there's like a lot of convoluted things and narratives out there about machines and technocrats and whatnot. Let's just push that out for a second. The way nature works is that plants take in CO2 and they put out oxygen, right? And then they sequester carbon into the ground as part of that process too. And so that's what's natural. We're missing plants all over the earth and the oceans are, people are saying the oceans are dying. Um, people are saying that the Atlantic Ocean could be dead within 20, 30 years. Um, there's, there's a lot of speculation. Um, it's not quite clear what's true, what's not. Um, but that's 70% you know, of the world is the ocean. And the 30% the of the earth is is land so it's really important that we understand these areas and we encourage them to increase their photosynthesis because as it is right now i mean we lost 90 percent of the kelp forests on the west coast and there still isn't a solid plan on how to regrow them there are people who can do it but they're not being allowed to do it it's really really frustrating um it's it's, it's i look forward to doing things in the gulf here um, doing things like the marine permaculture arrays uh, in the future so that we can we can start cleaning up uh, the, the oil spills, fixing the dead zone. I want to be part of that. But, but if we don't bring back nature, we can't expect to have the products of nature, clean water, clean air. And, and so we need to bring back the watersheds. We need to bring back the forests, the grasslands, the thriving wild coastlines, because they're filters. And then all the wetlands, because they're filters. And then all like the just off the coastline life where 90% of all this ocean life lives, and that all needs to be protected and brought up to a thriving level. And I'm not saying get rid of fishing because they're the ones who know that area best and can help you understand how to make it thrive in partnership with people who, who understand the animals really, really well. This is what Ducks Unlimited and the Audubon Society did together. They actually increase the population size every single year because they time and they, they do exact numbers on how many ducks they can harvest. And because of that, it actually increases the health of all the ducks. And it's this incredible thing because they're acting as predators and predator pressure is always at the right setting going to be regenerative. So if we can create a system that is more natural, that follows the principles of nature and that we value those things, permaculture, then we will get a result where things get better and better over time enhancing the base of the natural capital, the basis of all of our economies, that's regenerative. And so this is why no-till and low-till makes so much sense. Because the more carbon we have in the soil, the more energy we have, so the more nutrients can flow. And, 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 and at the same time, the more oxygen we can have to breathe. And we, we need to shift our agriculture to regenerative as well so that these fertilizer shortages have no effect on domestic production, which is incredible. We have the ability to produce, produce enough food here in America and every nation. We need to heal the landscape so first, right? <laughs> That's the key here. If we lose the landscape and the natural cycles and the power of those natural forces, we actually can't do our thing. Permaculture doesn't work if you destroy the entire landscape. So you could do a little permaculture patch and it works up to a point and then it's a little oasis and then, and then it's gone because the entire system has these violent, crazy storms and you're just one person, people are starving and the human element comes in. So as individuals, if we can develop regenerative soil, so that's high in organic matter, so that it has mineral coherency, so that's highly paramagnetic, soil that has the biology that's right and it's thriving, we're going to have plants that are resistant and resilient to pest damage, to climatic swings and, and wild events, and to disease and viruses. We even see endophytes 
retask viruses when they enter plants to do beneficial things. So our understanding of what health is, of what is possible, is all still in development. That's why the our soil database is gonna be such an incredible thing. I'm working on the designs right now, working with my team, and I will be sharing more with you soon on all those fronts and then inviting you all to join that database because it'll be free for everyone. So you're gonna like it. I wanted to share this with you today because I want people to understand that yes, oxygen is highly paramagnetic. Yes, we want our soils to be aerated enough to be able to have those interstitial spaces for water and, and, and soil gases. So there is all these different relationships happening all at once. We are seeing increasingly lower levels of oxygen. We're seeing the soil lose its charge. We're seeing the sky thin and lose the oxygen and our atmosphere thin. And the thinning of the atmosphere op opens us up to vulnerability, to weaker solar flares, having stronger effects, and, and even more things that people are theorizing about. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wild time to be alive because we understand our predicament better than anyone ever really has, it feels like. Though Plato, Aristotle, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson all believe that soil was linked to the rise and fall of civilizations. And that's why Dirt, Erosion of Civilizations by David Montgomery was written. Excellent book, highly recommend it. And that's, you know, where a lot of this information can, you can find the corollaries with the rise and fall of these empires. They're losing the energy in the soil, then they're losing the vitality in the, their food, and then they're, they're losing control of their systems. Kind of feels like that's what's happening right now. So that's why it's so important that we have the RSOIL database so that we can, we can link for every bioregion because everyone's going to be slightly unique. There's, there's baseline best practices that we've uncovered and shared and, and, and people recognize as what regenerative soil is, but there's going to be nuance. There's going to be local foods, local organic matter, local, you know, fish emulsion, and everything, all those things are going to create unique relationships that you take that same thing and scoop it up and put it into a different environment um, and it will behave subtly different. So mapping those subtleties, that's, that's, that's what the database is all about. And, and that's, you know, I want people to see with, with this fluency to be able to understand all these things from a principles, from a cycles, from a, a chemistry, from a biology, all these different perspectives combine to be able to have that holistic perspective. So all those tests go together and make our, help our understanding of soil as well as the holistic tests around plant health to create a never before seen understanding. And, and, and things like soil oxidation will be able to map, we'll, as citizen scientists will be able to track and, uh, and we'll be able to set things right. So I'm so excited to be part of this. I hope that you are too. I'm at Power, Grow Abundantly, Learn Daily, and Live Regeneratively. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, and I will see you soon with another video. And if you're going to be at MycoFest, I will see you this weekend. <laughs>